Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the last Lunch and Learn of the Versus Virus Incubator. It has been such a special journey. We have been together from spring until autumn, and we have met each and every week to help you learn something new so that you can do the things you want to bring into the world and help fight the COVID pandemic that unfortunately we are in the middle of again. Today is a very, very special day, not only because it's our last lunch and learn, because, but because we had a second presentation this morning, which was also very excited. If you haven't seen it, please watch it on YouTube. However, our last presentation today is going to give you an insight not only on how do best organizations manage their teams for high performance, but also how does the back, how does the working studio of the person who has been doing all those live streams for you look like? Because Daniel Dobush is the person who has, together with me, helping the verse, been helping the versus virus incubator to bring those learning experiences to all of you. So welcome, Daniel. Please let us into your studio. Now we can see where you're working from. You have been really sitting in the back there, preparing everything for us. And I'm really happy uh, to be able to introduce you to our participants, to our audience, and of course, to hear everything you have to share with us. So thanks again and uh, welcome to Front Stage. Hi, Viviana, thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me well. This is also for me today a little bit an experiment. I've been often a speaker. I've been often, you know, backstage. I've never tried both at the same time. So let's see how it works might completely fail it might works fine so let's have a look how that is working um, for example now i've completely disappeared which is wonderful but might i might come back so basically here we here we are okay when preparing for today i was thinking um what do we want to reach with one of the last lunch and learns do we want to entertain, do we want to inform you, I don't know, uh, maybe I try to do both somehow, try to combine. And so the title of today is a little bit strange, how to crash a startup like an airplane. What a strange title. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a particle physicist and hackathon organizer at uh, Gluonet, the University of Lancaster, the port at CERN, uh, Geneva, Switzerland. I need to start with a disclaimer. I don't crash airplanes professionally. It's more like a personal passion. It's more this personal passion to analyze airplane and other complex system accidents, their reports and investigations. And I think it's even our society's duty in respect to the victims and their families to best learn from these tragedies. While being this personal passion, uh, it dramatically helps me in succeeding professionally. And at the end of this workshop, I'm sure you will understand how it will help you to organize your startup or project better. Let me go to the next slide and show you that as a particle physicist at CERN, I was managing teams of up to 24 scientists from all over the world, operating the Atlas experiment of the Large Hadron Collider. So in our airplane analogy uh, this means we have been constructing together with 3000 engineers 
a completely new type of airplane and with 24 pilots from all over the world coming from all kinds of different cultures, we have been test flying it together for the very first time. It was an incredible learning. Um, going, going to the next slide. Let me see if I manage. You know me as a hackathon organizer, and this is my other second passion. I help to create over thirty different unique hackathons experiences. Uh, maybe the best known is the port at CERN, a humanitarian hackathon, and the latest and maybe the biggest, for sure the biggest. Sorry, it's was the co-organizing with a team from 160 different uh, organizations the versus virus hackathon that you all know well but one thing that you might not know is that it was an incredible striking experience to see that you can bring people from 160 different organizations together to organize something in less than two weeks that was an incredible learning mm -hmm. oh, sorry about that um, as a hackathon organizer, uh, you know, it's always interesting to, to learn what you can do in this very short time. So I don't have to tell you about the versus virus, um, 4,500 hackers, 500 mentors. My favorite project is still the one that basically led to allowing the Swiss parliament to have its digital parliament sessions, Pandemia parliament. But I like all the projects, but I found that somehow really, really concrete and, and intriguing. Um, in my other professional life, I'm a co-founder of Gluonet and we analyze global aviation big data to reduce the environmental impact, improve safety, increase capacity and reduce cost. Today, I would like to tell you about free aircraft accidents incidents. The question that I will ask you at the end is what we have in common? What is the striking commonality between these three very different events? The first one is on the 19th of July 1989. It was a perfect day uh, to fly from Denver to Chicago. Perfect flight over. You would have boarded this McDonnell Douglas DC-10, Series 10, with a call sign November 1819 uniform. So from today's perspective, you would have found something very strange. Three engines, one on the tail. Pilots loved this airplane. Uh, they called it the Cadillac Fleetwood of the skies. As with its three engines, it was extremely powerful. And at takeoff, the pilots put their hands on the throttle and it slammed you back into the seat. It was considered to be extremely safe due to this triple redundancy in the engines. And it was very comfortable and quiet. So with 18 years in service, it was a mid-aged airplane. So typically, these airplanes are operated until they're about 30 years old. About one hour and seven minutes into the flight, you would have finished your meal. Uh, still, you would have maybe smelled the chicken strips that they served. And you would have suddenly heard an incredible explosion at the back of the airplane. You would have fought with a bomb for sure. And you would have been smashed into your seat again, while the airplane immediately inclined and climbed 300 feet. For sure, you would have spilled your tomato juice. You would have seen the flight attendants directly grabbing the next armrest, diving to the ground trying to avoid being sucked out of the airplane in case it was an explosive decompression. But nothing happened. It was not a bomb. It was not an explosive decompression. In the meantime, in the cockpit, you might have seen 57-year-old Captain Alfred C. Haynes, 49-years-old co-pilot First Officer Robert V. Records, 
and 51-year-old flight engineer Dudley G. Dvorak, first giving a brief look at their blue oxygen mask that you also see in the pictures, followed by a look on the cabin pressure gauge that didn't move. No explosive decompression. With 30, 20 and 15,000 hours of flight experience, and out of those 7,633 hours on the DC-10, they were all more than reasonably qualified. First officer Bob Records immediately grabbed the yoke, switched off the autopilot and shouted, I've got it. Flight engineer Dvorak immediately sees on the gauge that engine two failed. So following standard operation procedures, he radios the air traffic control center to request to descend to a lower flight level. A single engine loss is not an emergency on a DC-1010. It's actually not even a really big deal. Captain Haynes, Captain Haynes asks Flight Engineer Dwork to read out the engine shutdown list. First point, reduce the throttle to idle. The lever won't move. Second point, cut the fuel supply. He tries, it won't move. Latest here, it was clear that this is not just an engine failure, not an engine flame out, not an engine shutdown. It is something serious. He knows that because of a DC-10, all his controls are physical connections steel cables. Huh? That's not true anymore today. First officer Bob Records seeks the attention of his captain. Al, I can't control the, the plane. Uh, we don't know the exact words. Uh, as the cockpit voice recorder was on on a 30 minute loop, so the first 14 minutes of his incidents are not recorded. Captain Hayes looks over and sees that Bob has turned the yoke all to the left and pulled back all the way. Something that you would never see during a normal cruise speed. And this is like they would be turning the, the steering wheel of a car totally to the left or right while driving on the motorway. Still, the airplane goes the opposite direction. It goes right and down. He takes the yoke, tries to control the airplane. No effect. In the meantime, Flight Engineer Dvorak studies what is happening. He realizes suddenly that the horizon is tilted. The airplane is banking by over 35 degrees. Huh? Way more than what one normally would use for any commercial airplane. He shouts, we are rolling. Captain Hayes reaches down, closes the throttle of engine one sets the throttle of engine 3 to full and with that asymmetric power slowly rolls back the airplane into level. Simulation runs later will show that reacting in any other way or a few seconds later would have rolled over the airplane into a constant irrevocable straight descent. We saved the airplane in that moment. Daddy Dwork addresses the passengers of a passenger, a passenger um, announcement system, the PA system, to tell them that they lost the tail engine, that the airplane can fly fine without two, with two engines only, and that they will descend and continue to Chicago. Which is a standard procedure, nothing to really worry about. Just seconds later, Dudley realizes what he was searching over time so on those hundreds of gorges that you don't have in airplanes anymore. Huh? He sees that they have no hydraulic pressure and no hydraulic fluid in any of the three hydraulic systems. He now understands that the airplane is not controllable. First officer records now declares emergency to air traffic control and asks for the nearest suitable airport. They are sent to Sioux City. They call flight head flight attendant uh, Jan Brown to the flight deck. She's the second of the left with a turquoise jacket together with her fellow flight attendants of flight 232. 
After the loud explosion and the heavy banking of the airplane, she knows immediately that being called to the flight deck at this stage of a flight is not a good sign. In her memories, she tells that her entire world changed when the cockpit door opened. No panic, but the sense of crisis was immediately evident. They tell her that they have no hydraulic pressure, that they can't control the airplane, and that she should prepare for evacuation in about 30 minutes. Captain Haynes asks flight attendant injured Dudley to read out the procedure to handle a complete hydraulic loss. There is no procedure. The possibility that all three redundant hydraulic systems would fail at once was rated so low that there was no procedure. They decided that Dudley radios United Airlines maintenance, while Captain L makes the initial contact Sioux, uh, Sioux City Tower, and this is a guy called Kevin Bachmann. In order to understand Kevin Bachmann's reaction, let's see if we can listen to what they discussed. You don't, you don't hear, hear it, do you? Sorry, Sorry, I think, I think we're we're not, not able to listen to that. Let me figure out that in the meantime. But we can we can read it. Um, let me try to. So, okay. So you know we have uh, almost no controllability. Ah, very little elevator and almost no aileron. We are controlling the turns by power. I don't think we can turn right. I think we can only make left turns. We are starting a little bit of a left turn right now. Maybe we can only turn right. We can't turn left. And I think I found a problem with the sound. So if you give me one second, I might be able to. It's strange because we tested that before. So. Okay, let's see if it now works. Okay, so you know we have almost no control of the building. Uh, very little elevator and almost no Elon. Uh, we're controlling the current by power. I don't think we can turn right, but I think we can only make a little turn. We're always starting a little bit of a little turn. I mean, we can only turn right if we can't turn up. United 232 Heavy, I uh, understand, sir. Uh, you can only make right turns. <laughs> So in order to understand Kevin Bachmann's calm but surprised reaction, the message he got was that there is an airplane heading towards his airport that can control its ascent and descent, so it can go straight. 
nor its role. The only way to control the direction is to turn right by controlling the engines. Sounds wonderful. And not as usually by rolling the airplane with the ailerons, and I will show you later. On the wings, you know how an airplane goes, right? He needs a second to digest that. Huh? In the middle of a message, the cockpit voice recorder is starting, so we know also the exact words they spoke now from the cockpit that we just heard. At about that time, um, Jane Brown had briefed her first class flight attendant, Virginia Jan Murray, that you see just next to her with a pink top, who returns to the first class sections, to, to the first class section of the airplane. Danny Fitch sees her distressed, gets her attention and pulls her aside. They talked before it on the flight, so uh, he says, Jen, don't worry about this. This is thing flies just fine on two engines. She leans in and whispers, uh, Oh no, Danny, the captain told us we lost all hydraulics. She tells him that because she knows that Danny Fitch is also a DC-10 pilot in civilian dress commuting to Chicago. But Danny Fitch is not only a DC-10 pilot, he's a DC-10 check pilot, spending most of his time in full motion flight simulators, preparing other pilots um, for impossible by guiding them through all possible emergency scenarios. So he immediately knows that Jan must be wrong, as a DC-10 has a triple redundant hydraulic system. So three systems completely independent and separated and isolated from each other. And only one is enough to control the airplane. So each of the flight control surfaces is controllable by at least two of the systems. So there's no way that you can be right. The reason for that, for this triple redundancy, and you see that here where the air control surfaces that you see marked now here in red, is that the DC-10 belongs to the first generation of airplanes that has no manual reversion. What does that mean? It means that the air control surfaces are just too big and have so much forces acting on them that if a hydraulic fails anyhow you can't wrestle them by human force. Uh, humans are just too weak to pull all these forces that are on this. So Danny has never taken anybody through the scenario of a full hydraulic loss because there was no need of that. Huh? Um, first, it cannot happen. Second, um, if it happens, and yeah, you cannot do anything about it. What check pilot Danny Fitch doesn't know in this moment, and nobody knows at this time, was that the fan rotor disc of a front of a tail engine had failed in an uncontained way. So what does it mean? The failure was caused by a microscopic defect. You see that there's this red arrow. And closed during production, a so-called hard alpha inclusion. And the titanium alloy rotor that you see there um, has been cracked and um, this was undetected during inspections. So. so in this red arrow there was a tiny little crack and then at some point the entire rotor broke. The fan blades were broken into over 70 sharp fragments, torn gashes into the aircraft's tail stabilizer. On the right you see the reconstruction blade trajectories uh, that pierced the stabilizers. So you see each of this line is basically a fragment that has been f uh, flying away. Um, and here, and only here, in the tail stabilizer section, the three hydraulic systems that I was talking about are close to each other. You see them here in black, blue, and red. The fan blade fragments severed the first and third system hydraulic lines and part of the first and second hydraulic systems were just ripped off with the initial explosion. This forced a loss of pressure and a quick loss of all hydraulic fluid in all the three systems. Within two minutes, all hydraulic fluids had completely drained from the lines. A photo taken from the airplane just a few seconds before the airplane crash shows all the damages. The photo quality is not too good, but you see this light uh, at the red arrow is shining through the big holes in the stabilizers. It speaks a very, very clear language. Huh? So a lot of these fragments are shooting through the airplane uh, control surfaces. 
Not knowing all this, but knowing that Jen must be completely wrong, then he asks Jen to let Captain Hayes know that he has a DC-10 training check airman on board, and if there is anything that he can do to assist, he would be happy to do so. Captain L is hoping that maybe the check airman, uh, this experienced um, um, introducer to how to fly airplanes, has a procedure not in the books and welcomes him to the cockpit. There are three parallel conversations, so it's difficult to listen. Let's see if you can if you can read along. We start. We start to say, um, "My name is Al Haynes." So it's Captain Haynes, and then uh, Danny says, "Hi, Al. Danny Fitch." And the captain asks, Bex, "How do you do, Danny?" So, so Captain, Captain Hens has, has no, no solution, solution. and he can only comes up with this, this proposal. I can't think of anything that we haven't done. The reason there, is, there really isn't a procedure for this. And Danny Fitch confirms, no, both agree there is no procedure for this in the books. Both are well aware that nobody had survived the loss of a flight control in the last 25 years. Danny Fitch has learned uh, about a similar crash in 1985 by Japan Airlines 123 caused by a catastrophic loss of hydraulic control and had wondered if it was possible to control an aircraft using throttles only. He had practiced under similar conditions on a simulator. So he squats between them and controlled both engines at the same time. Here's the radar track. Uh, the plane enters the radar track at the bottom. You see that at the blue line, um, the blue arrow here. The engine fails at the top at the red triangle. And Danny Fitch takes over the throttles at the middle pink airplane. And you see suddenly they are able to control the airplane a little bit, but not too much. And you see they continue just turning right. They managed to reduce the descent of the airplane, but they have not too much luck going straight. And you see that uh, they're just going in circles. So doubting they can make it to the airport, they call the head flight attendant, Jen Brown, back to the cockpit. Let's see, again, this is many different conversations going in parallel. Let's see if we can listen to that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> A very transparent, honest and direct communication. Jen Brown goes back and instructs her fellow flight attendants. In the meantime, there is some excitement in the cockpit as after two full ride circles, you see now we are basically at the violet airplane, they finally managed to turn left here, the top middle pink airplane. Okay, that's two thirty two. We're turning left turn back to the airport. Uh, we have, since we have no hydraulic braking, it's going to really be a problem. Uh, I would suggest you put the torch far into the runway. And uh, I think.
Whatever you do, keep us away from the city. Huh? They were all but optimistic. After finally some success to fly straight, and with the airport in sight, you also then see them that they are a little bit more optimistic. So after finally some success to fly straight and to align with the airport, you can hear the relief when they have the airport in sight. With all that stress, Captain Haynes cracks the jokes with the air traffic control. I want to make it a runway, huh? They're well aligned on the runway, but they are way too fast. With no hydraulics for the slats and flaps, they can bleed off speed. And this is like the airplane is just rushing in. They're traveling with about 250 miles an hour. A normal DC-10 lands about half a speed, 125 miles per hour, double speed. And the sink rate, three times of a maximum specified sink rate, six times of a normal landing. So you can imagine what kind of uh, impact that would be. I will show you a video of a crash. There's a lot of fire and smoke, so you might not want to watch parts of that if you are sensitive to that. They almost did it, um, but Hapt Captain Hayes later said that their luck ran out roughly 50 feet above the runway. The right wing dips, hits the runway, the plane cartwheels and catches fire, as you have seen maybe in the video. But you see they have been extremely close. Um, of 296 people on board, 185 survived. The NTSB put 40 different flight crews into the simulator, replaying the same flight conditions. Um, and a very few of these flight crews even came close to the airport, as close as the UA-232. None managed a better landing than the original crew. More than that to the people he saved. There is no hero. There is just a group of four people who did their job. The second, the next two incidents I will show you, I will show you in much less details, even though they are similar complex as with United Airlines 232 incidents. But the striking commonality can also be spotted in this very short descriptions. The second incident you might even remember, Air France 447, it was scheduled from Rio de Janeiro to Paris on the 1st June 2009 on the Airbus uh, A330-203 and the registration FGCCP, sorry, FGZCP, and it was 50-year-old flight captain Marc Dubois, 37-year-old first officer David Robert, and 32-year-old first officer Pierre Cédric Bonin were taking turns on this long flight. About three hours and 40 minutes in the flight, they entered an area of storms and turbulences.
Likely, Likely the three, sorry. Likely the three aircraft pilot tubes got obstructed by ice crystals, which created temporary inconsistencies between the airspeed measurements and disengaged the autopilot. And three seconds later, the auto trust system disengaged. Captain Dubois was taking a rest. First officer co pilot Bono was in control. He was worried that they overspeed. He tried. Um, he tried to correct the roll of the right, same what we have heard before, right, from the other airplane, by deflecting his side stick to the left, but overcorrected and was fighting for the next 30 seconds of the airplane, rolling alternatively to the left and right. He abruptly pulled back on the side stick, raising the nose, causing aerodynamic stall of the airplane started to fall. They called the captain back to the cockpit. Just under a minute after he was first pulled, Captain Dubois returns to the cockpit taking the jump seat behind the young brothers. Because Bonin is still pulling the stick back, the nose is up and the plane is stalling. He thinks the plane is going too fast and moves to put on the air brakes. A few seconds later, so soon after co-pilot Robert said, climb, 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 Bonin replied, but I've been at maximum nose up for a while. No, Captain Dubois realized Bonin was causing the stall and shouted, no, 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 don't climb, no, no, no. This is the last thing what is recorded. They couldn't recover from the aerodynamic stall and only a few seconds later, Air France 447 was actually crashing into the Atlantic Ocean, killing all 228 passengers and crew. The aircraft flight recorder was not recovered from the ocean floor until May 2011, nearly two years later. The third incident I would like to tell you about is Qantas Flight 32 from London to Sydney via Singapore on the 4th November 2010. The Airbus Air 380 suffered an uncontained failure in one of its four Trent 900 engines. The failure occurred four minutes after takeoff from Singapore Changi Airport over Batam Island, Indonesia. Here is Captain Richard Champion de Crispigny with his 35 years of flight experience, 35 years of flight experience about what happened. Because I say, if you haven't flown on a 380, which is actually totally inappropriate today, but I say that it's smooth, it's comfortable, it's powerful, and, powerful, and, 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 and more most importantly, it is so amazingly quiet. Four minutes after takeoff, two explosions. Is that one engine failing twice, or is it two engines failing? I don't care, it doesn't matter. I press the altitude hold that makes the nose come down to level and makes it should ease the thrust on the engine so it should stabilize. I check we're above the safety height, we're not going to crash into the mountains. Then I press the head in hold button. That stops the aircraft following a curved departure, locks our trajectory, and now we're in a straight path. And then I look, mind you, at the time the alarms are going off, the top 
screens coming in red lights, the checklists are erupting on the screens in front. No one's saying a word except me. And then I look at the speed. The speed's increasing. We're about to overspeed the aircraft. No time to think about it. I grab the thrust leaders, rip them back. I stay in pilot. We're at constant altitude, constant heading, constant airspeed. We're above the mountains. We are safe. ECAN action. Was that, was that a bit, a bit distracting? Because that's, that's what, what it's like. like. That, that alarm went off about 125 times during the flight. flight. Very distracting. You have to keep your focus. focus. We, didn't we didn't race into a checklist. checklist. If you, you race into a checklist, checklist before you check the aircraft is flying, flying you may not even get, get to finish the first checklist, checklist before you crash. crash. The, the, the aviation rule for pilots is aviate, navigate, communicate. Rule number one, and that's what we did. It took about a minute. Interesting. Interesting. When the engine disintegrated, it caused extensive damage to the nacelle. So this is, you know, this is what holds the engine. To the wing, fuel system, landing gear, flight controls, engine controls, and a fire in a fuel tank that has self-extinguished. The subsequent investigation concluded that the failure had been caused by the breaking of a stub oil pipe, which had been manufactured improperly. The crew was holding for almost two hours to assess, to assess the situation, when the aircraft made a successful emergency landing at Changi. There were no injuries to the passengers, crew or people on the ground, despite debris from the aircraft falling into the houses in Bataan. So let's come to the interactive part. Now over to you. Grab the joke, take control, and think what are the commonalities between these three very different events. We have two minutes individually before we will discuss all together. So recall a little bit what, what you have heard. What kind of commonalities can you think of? And then in two minutes, please tell me what you found. Liliana, you have already an idea. So if you're ready, tell me if you found something interesting. Same for me. With all that passion for all that for aircraft accident, same for me. Great, thank you. 
Anybody else? I see a few. I see that all, all pilots were very prepared. So they had hundreds, uh, they had training and they had experience that during, during the incident, they, they took a hard look at things. And well, uh, some didn't because they weren't in the cockpit. And that afterwards, they spent a lot of time debriefing from the incident. Okay. Thanks a lot. Anybody else? Okay, so I can jump. I can jump in there. Good. I think uh, what I heard, at least in two of the um, of the airplanes, there was no procedure on the the first and in the last case, uh, there was no procedure that could be uh, referred to, and also uh, there was no time actually to refer in the in the last airplane in the in the last accident to refer to any procedure, which uh, meant uh, they had to mobilize all the resources they had on board and in the tower to help them do the magic. Great, yes, all nice commentaries. And I, I think I can try to summarize all what you said by saying the commonalities between all the three incidents is that the human interaction, and Adela said it very, very nicely, in the cockpit decided about the faith of the airplane. The flight crew is the most important factor. They can turn a tiny system failure, as we have seen in one example, through a series of cascading events into a catastrophic disaster. Or they can turn a catastrophic system failure, like in the first case, in an impossible way to the minimal possible damage. Um, let me tell you about, and now we are going to the real part of this, let me tell you about crew resource management. I don't want to tell you all kind of details. There's a lot of literature about it. There's a lot of theory about that. This is not my goal today. I just want to tell you and make you curious what it is. So CRM is crew resource management. In the late 70s, a series of plane crashes led to investigations and the result of it was devastating. About 70% of the uh, incidents and accidents were caused by human errors. And in most cases, the crew even knew the solution among them, how to prevent that. The latest of these events was an incident and it was marking the start of CRM. It was United Airlines 173. On the 28th of December, uh, 1978, 50 years old, 52 year old Captain Melbourne McBroom with 27,000 hours of flight experience and with 5.5 thousand hours experience on the DC-8 was flying a DC-8 of United Airlines 173 from New York to Portland. During their approach, the right gear fall free due to a corroded retracted cylinder. So it made a loud noise and the gear was correctly locked but a tiny little micro switch broke from the fall, made the crew believe the opposite. So they thought that the, that the gear is not locked. They aborted the approach. So that you see that here on the, on the right side and flew for one hour in a holding pattern. You see that they're turning circles. And they crashed due to fuel starvation, a perfectly flying airplane. And stunning is that the other members of the crew tried to make the captain aware of his fuel issue at least three times, as the voice recording shows. The NTSB concluded the airplane crash due to poor collective situational awareness, failures in the team communication, misunderstandings. They crashed in the woods in a populated area of suburban Portland. Eight passengers and two crew members, including the flight engineer, died. Luckily, 170 people survived. So this crash, you know, that was really of a perfectly flying air crane, led to the establishment of crew resort management in 1980. Crew resource management is designed for high performance teams. What does it mean? 
High performance teams are defined to be composed of individuals with proven skills and knowledge to handle difficult and complex scenarios. Like a flight crew, an astronaut team, uh, a team of, um, of people trying out something first time, uh, test pilots, all those kind of jobs where you have to try to do things that were not typically procedures, as Bigana nicely said. But one thing is that this high performance team suffer exactly from the same communication failures as any other group. Even more difficult, this kind of high performance teams, as they're called, they often involve strong personalities and are difficult to lead. But this is what you're aiming for in your startup or your project. You want to have a high performance team. So the goal, the primary goal of CRM is enhancing situational awareness, self-awareness, leadership assertiveness, decision-making, flexibility and adaptability, event and mission analysis and communication. Specifically, CRM aims to foster a climate or culture where authority may be respectfully questioned. This is the most important part of it. So there must be a way how to communicate to a pilot because many of this voice recording showed that you know, the pilot couldn't listen or couldn't understood what the crew knew was the right the situation. So cockpit voice recordings of various air disasters revealed first officers and flight engineers attempting to bring critical information to a captain attention in an indirect and ineffective way. By the time the captain understood what was being said, it was too late to avert the disaster. If you become a pilot today or you lead high performance teams, you learn in many months about the best CRM methods. And I'm not even trying to uh, summarize it. So all attempts to summarize this in this very short time are naturally insufficient. So only so much. If you lead a team in which everybody's voice can be heard respectfully, you already achieved a lot. And one of the best summaries I heard from somebody who has used it perfectly is in a real situation as Captain L. Haynes. The preparation that paid off for the crew was something that the United Airlines started in 1980 called Cockpit Resource Management. Up until 1980, we kind of worked on the concept that the captain was the, the authority, whatever, whatever he should do. And uh, we've lost a few airplanes because, because of that. Now, we, we had 103 years of flying experience here in the cockpit, trying, trying to get that airplane on the ground. Not, not one, one minute, minute of which we had actually practiced, practiced any one of us. So, so why, why would I know more about getting that airplane on the ground under those conditions than the other three? three. So if so I had not used CLR, if we had not let everybody put their input in, it's okay, so after this tiny little introduction to CRM, uh, there's one last task for you. So what is the worst possible scenario you can imagine happening at your startup or project? I'll give you again two minutes to think about it, to come up with some scenarios, maybe you already thought of some. So what are you most afraid of? And have you thought what you would do if that happened? I'll be left all alone and uh, I would have to decide and uh, take action on my own. Uh, and usually if I'm left in such situations, I don't perform at my best and I know it very well. Okay, thanks Brianna. Anybody else? Uh, similar as uh, Biliana's. Um, with a little twist, <laughs> for example, we are a group of four people, two of them are uh, key 
because they are at the core of what we are uh, creating. Let's say that we, the entrepreneurs, more or less, we are uh, replaceable. But those two key people, if something happens, like we somehow manage to disengage them <laughs> or not keep them motivated, or uh, I don't know, you know, we are in a time of pandemic. If something happens, then um, we don't have a project, you know? So uh, this is the fear. The one, uh, the first one, uh, keeping a uh, team motivated, I would say that's, okay, it's not easy, but it's the easiest. The other way um, is like uh, in the first example, like all uh, the fluids were not working in the three uh, systems. And um, in our case, uh, I don't know if we can uh, make it work like <laughs> United uh, Airlines. Great. Anybody else? Yes. And mine is that one person who was in the team and then didn't deliver and left uh, may do something, something similar. Okay. We have time for one last. No? What Good. is your biggest fear, Daniel? My, my biggest fear, I think, for, for my startup is failing communication uh, and all the consequences that comes through that because this is often very, very difficult to, to correct. So, um, because we humans, you know, always remember and we can forgive. But often when if communication went wrong, sometimes it's very, very hard to come back to the same kind of trust. Um, this is, for example, the reason in aviation and in many other kind of high performance crews, you constantly rotate the team. So if you're basically flying an airplane, you're not flying all the time with the same team. Which you could think maybe the best because then you know everybody the best possible way. But intentionally, you know, these crews are rotated. So I think that would be my biggest fear uh, that with a, in a startup where you cannot constantly rotate and you want to stay with the same people, that this kind of failures in communication lead to long-term effects. Anybody else? Okay, then let me try to summarize. The time is up. So I hope I could show you that uh, it's maybe worth to look into crew resource management. There's a many, many good resources and books about it. The reference i will show you a few of them but if i want that you remember one thing is if you ever have to crash a startup or a project crash it like an airplane so be prepared for it be trained for it um, think about that you have listened to everybody and what the best possible is to do that and in order to able to do and find this best possible way in the very very short time that you might have for that it's very helpful to, to study crew resource management and if you think that doesn't make sense and you can handle all by yourself if you can be the captain that knows all the answers then please at least make, make sure that, that you, you are, are We have two comments. Uh, Miguel says, yes, I confirm that team member
Rihanna, we don't hear you. Left because of a communication. Yes. And then it says, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Miguel, would you like to share something? Yes, yes, I really like the presentation very much. Thank you. I think you strongly made the point that communication can turn a small problem into a catastrophe or can turn a big problem into a success. The videos had some feedback when you played them. Uh, are you going to share the slides with the with the link so we can watch them again? Yes. I'm sorry for that Thank horrible you. sound. I don't know exactly what happened. Um, I tried that all morning and it worked fine. I don't fully understand. I will share the slides for sure. And we can see if we can improve the audio quality. Really sorry for that. It was intelligible enough. I just w like to watch them again. Sure. Thank you. Any uh -huh. other question or comment? Good, then back to you, Brianna. Okay, thank you. I would like uh, to repeat something which I heard in the last, in one of the last videos, which was aviate, navigate, communicate. And I think it simply says it all. Uh, so I want to wish you well. I want to wish you that you really successfully aviate your projects, uh, you navigate them wisely, and of course, uh, skillfully, and most of all, communicate from your head, from your heart, from your intuition, so that not only you can be heard, but you can also use all the instruments that we have been given by Mother Nature. So on that note, I want to remind you that the Lunch and Learn, that the Lunch and Learn was part of the Versus Virus Incubator. That was the continuation, first ever continuation after a virtual hackathon. Uh, and that it lasted for 27 weeks. We did, we learned and sometimes lunched um, every Friday. We had 26 sessions. We had one midterm pitch. We had 27 speakers and more than 2000 views online. And we're particularly proud of this because our intention was indeed to create a library for you to be able to go and really listen and focus on the particular thing that you wanted to learn and to be able to bring into your project. So having said that, let me show you briefly who were our speakers. Here they are. And I have to share with you that all of those speakers did their presentations for free and they were really happy to support you uh, to grow, to aviate, to navigate, and to communicate. Uh, and uh, of course, the Lunch and Learn would have not been possible without the dedicated versus virus incubator team, uh, Nora, Nikki, Christoph, Carolos, Daniel, and myself. And that it was mainly Daniel and myself who really took up this initiative and brought it to you. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll see you on demo day. If you want to reach out, help us, um, share your pitches with us, uh, ask for feedback, we are here for you, please do so. And we remain at your exposure anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.